Okay, folks, we're getting to the end now. This is going to be one of my last lectures to you as I introduce this final unit of our class. This unit's going to involve some guest visits as before, and also some reading and some assignments. And the focus at the end is going to be this negotiation project. So our last week is going to be devoted to a mock Paris negotiation. I'll be describing it just a bit today. We'll be talking about, about it much more in the weeks to come. It should be a lot of fun, and I hope you enjoy it. First, though, let me give you the big overview. So the focus, again, is on climate solutions for this unit. My argument is that mitigation is really more pressing than adaptation right now. And so we'll be talking a lot about mitigation strategies to reduce our carbon footprint. Focus also a bit on Penn State, what Penn State's been doing already to significantly reduce its carbon footprint, and then preparing for this climate negotiation. The objectives for this week are to understand what mitigation strategies are and what Penn State's doing to reduce its carbon footprint. So we want to begin this Friday with a virtual field trip to the East Campus Power Plant. Again, normally we do this in person. Actually, with 100 students, it wouldn't even be possible. And so the virtual field trip that I put together with uh, the STEAM supervisor, Paul Moser, will help you understand how Penn State produces its energy and how it uses it and its plans for reducing that in the future. And then a week from Wednesday, we're going to have another class visit, a webinar with Rob Cooper, who is the Senior Director for Energy and Engineering here at Penn State. Rob's got the best overview of what Penn State is doing with its power plants and also with its new solar farms to really reduce its carbon footprint. We also want to talk about alternative energy in general and to think about wind and solar and the optimal path forward as we start to make large corporate decisions on climate change. You will have to keep up with the readings and there will be a quiz on April 16th. That will be the last quiz, again, like all the others, only worth 20 points. And then the negotiation project. To prepare for this, we have Dr. Caitlin, Caitlin Grady coming to visit us. Dr. Grady was actually part of international negotiations for the Montreal Protocol of the Kigali Amendment. So this is a, a long, complicated story, and she'll introduce us to this history and to the process of international negotiations. For the mock negotiations, you are all going to be representing countries. And so you want to start thinking about which country you want to represent uh, in your research pod. So this will be the last act of your research pods as you work together to represent one country at these international negotiations. So let's think a little bit about clean energy, and about the whole idea of a technological fix to climate change. Wind and solar are, are things we've talked about a bit. We want to explore them in much more detail now. Biofuels also could be part of the solution. We have some Penn State researchers working on all of these fields, uh, biofuels in particular, because we are an agricultural university. We have to really think about nuclear. Uh, so a lot of people who are in the environmental movement are not comfortable with nuclear power and for good reason. Uh, we just saw that in the disaster in Japan, the tsunami, but there have been many other uh, accidents like this in the past, notably our own Three Mile Island in Harrisburg. And so nuclear energy is uh, in, in a way carbon free, at least when it's running. Uh, but it's enormously intensive in terms of its environmental footprint. Natural gas, of course, is also a big energy uh, sector here in Pennsylvania. We are one of the largest producers of natural gas in the country. Can natural gas be so, a so-called bridge fuel, so a fossil fuel, but one that burns more cleanly than coal, for example, about twice as clean, and, and can then perhaps offer some reduction in carbon dioxide 
while getting us to a cleaner future? So all of these questions come in in terms of uh, clean energy. But as I had mentioned before, if we're going to get down to uh, and, and stay below the two degrees centigrade rise, we have to actually start sequestering carbon dioxide. We have some experts here on campus who work on carbon capture, carbon capture and reuse or carbon capture and sequestration. This is all a process of taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere through a chemical process and then either reusing it, so converting that carbon dioxide into something else, into fuels, into food, or simply injecting it into the ground. This is already being done on small scales. Here's a plant on the banks of the Ohio River uh, where some of those smokestack emissions are actually captured and then injected into the ground. It's enormously energy intensive to, to do this. Uh, and it does not capture all of the carbon dioxide that comes out of the plant. So there's a lot to, to think about, to talk about with this. Um, and it's one of the many technologies that we have to pay attention to. Geoengineering has uh, been part of the discussion for a very long time. More and more as we get closer to some of these tipping points, it may be necessary. Uh, some of this involves things like blocking the sun, so reducing the amount of radiation that the Earth receives from the sun and thereby cooling the sun. Options include things like putting giant mirrors in space, really putting giant mylar mirrors in space to block out part of the sun, um, or injecting uh, aerosols into the high upper atmosphere to, to block the sun. So global dimming is something that has been discussed as a solution to global warming. Another possibility is to, uh, and, and Dr. Ray Najar talked about this several weeks ago, to actually seed the oceans with iron in order to cause blooms of algae, which then photosynthesize, capture carbon dioxide, and then die and fall to the ocean floor. With all of these, especially on the scale that we're talking to actually affect uh, the, the Earth, there would be consequences. And these would be unforeseen consequences. When you're fiddling with a system this large and this complex, it is frankly impossible to know exactly how all these things would work out. And so there's a, a lot of nervousness, a lot of anxiety about these kinds of geoengineering solutions. But again, some of them uh, might have to be part of the mix, depending on the choices that we're facing in the next couple of decades. One that doesn't get a lot of, uh, uh, of airtime is simply conservation, simply using less. And, and the, the thing about conservation is that uh, on the one hand, it's hard because it involves changing people's attitudes and their practices. We certainly saw in terms of uh, COVID and trying to restrict people's movements or their, their freedoms, how difficult this can be. But the benefits are immediate. The, the very fact that, uh, for example, we tend to incentivize uh, faculty members at Penn State to go to conferences, to fly off uh, to international and national events in order to be part of the, the latest discussions on whatever their field might be. What if we stopped incentivizing that? What if we asked faculty members to pay for that themselves? Well, then they choose the conferences that they'd go to. I'm sure some of you know professors who are gone, well, not this year, but in the past, who have been gone all the time at various international events. It gives a person prestige in the field. What if we change that formula? Um, and now, learning from COVID, involved ourselves more in Zoom conferences and webinars. So these types of changes uh, could have immediate instant benefits, uh, and they do not require investing in new infrastructure. They simply require making do with, with less. So conservation really must be part of this discussion. Pope Francis would tell us 
that technical solutions themselves cannot fix humanity. Uh, what we need to do is to think about what's important in life, what our vision is and, and what we value. Uh, so, the, as we see with uh, Robert Bullard's presentation, those of you who were able to attend last week, the problem with a lot of these technical solutions is that they tend to map along the same patterns of justice and injustice that we've already built into our society. One of these that we've discussed is this enormous disparity in wealth between uh, the, the part of the world that produces most carbon dioxide and has the greatest wealth and the part that's going to suffer the most from global warming and who has the least wealth. So making these decisions in advance, thinking about the way that society is structured should help us move forward in a more just way that simultaneously addresses our global warming problem and also addresses some of these serious justice issues. So what is the optimal path forward? If we're looking at this economically, so this is again William Nordhaus, the Nobel Prize winning economist, who offered that the optimal economic path would mean about three to four degrees Celsius warming. So about twice the amount of warming that we've had so far. This amount of warming is simply unacceptable for certain people, certainly if you're an island nation, because it will include greater sea level rise and greater amounts of storms and, and rainfall. Uh, so although the economy will be able to react, in fact, there are a lot of presumptions about the way people will respond that, that may not in fact happen. So this optimal economic path is, is really unacceptable. And so it will require a much greater investment into infrastructure, into changing our way of life in the short term. If we are successful, you will know because these changes will happen in the next 10 to 20 years. Richard Alley compares this with public investments in sewers. And this is a really interesting thing to think about is that you know most cities previous to the 18th and 19th century did not have public sewers. Now people just dumped their shit literally out the window. And, and the very notion that the public could get together and be responsible for this at first seemed impossible. And yet, Historically, it wasn't. When we go back to Roman cities, we see that they had public sewers. Uh, so putting society together, making these sorts of investments. Right now, of course, currently, the Biden administration is talking about a new $2 trillion investment in infrastructure that includes climate change in that plan. This is the kind of massive investment that is really necessary and that will have benefits down the line. So this is going beyond Nordhaus. It's not just adding a carbon tax, but also adding significant investments uh, in the public. And this push-pull method is probably the one that's going to get us where we need to go at this point. We can actually plan this all out the concept of wedges has to do with what we foresee in terms of changes in our energy infrastructure and how that will affect carbon dioxide. This means making a plan. And to take Penn State's example here, you see that this plan goes back to 2005 when Penn State started implementing these various wedges so first buying renewable energy credits, which then it phased out, and then including um, its, its programs of conservation and of repurposing uh, and, and recommissioning its buildings. Again, Rob Cooper will be talking about this quite a bit, um, as well as now purchase of um, energy from its new solar farms. So in all these ways, you see that the presumption is, is that Penn State's normal energy footprint would go up 
right? As it continued to expand, and it has continued to increase the amount of square footage in classroom buildings and offices and labs and such. And at the same time, then reducing its energy usage. Um, so when uh, at one point, right, this went down to 17.5%, now it's at 35% below 2005 levels. And there is a real plan, again, as Rob Cooper will talk about, to get down to 80% below. Is this enough? Can Penn State do better? Is that our part to reduce our carbon footprint by 80%? Or is what our part is, is actually to go much lower, to go carbon negative, if you will, in order to demonstrate to the world how this can be done? So there's a lot to talk about uh, in terms of making these sorts of plans. And in terms of what each country can do. Again, countries are so different in terms of their wealth as well as their carbon footprint. The question of what every country ought to do is a very thorny issue indeed. And in all this, it can't just be a matter of doing less harm as uh, William McDonough says, but we need to have a vision of doing more good. So here are three of Tesla's new cars. Uh, there are any number of new electric vehicles uh, coming out this year and next year. I drive an electric car, they are just better. They are more fun to drive. Why not have a future that is better and more fun? Uh, rather than just less disaster and less suffering. Uh, so this concept of how we envision the future, how we motivate others to be a part of this is tremendously important as we look at this ethically. So what do we do? I want to focus just for a second on individual choices versus corporate choices. Because I know this question, what do we do, is something that's been expressed by a lot of you and is something that I hear a lot from audiences when I speak uh, publicly or from other students. And the focus tends to be on what can I do as an individual? And that's reasonable because we have control over what we do as individuals. Some people have tried to map this out and have looked at things like recycling or changing your light bulbs. And the fact is, is that these have a, an ultimately not a great uh, impact in terms of everybody's individual carbon footprint. Things that have a much higher impact are getting an electric car or getting rid of a car, going car free. Um, note here the, the place of uh, one round trip transatlantic flight. So I was just talking with a student who was rather surprised to find out just how large his carbon footprint is because he flies a lot. And this has become part of a lifestyle for many people, simply to fly a lot, whether it's to spring break down to Florida or to go to Europe in the summer. There are people who do this a lot. If this seems strange to you because you're not from a family that does this, that's a representation of the fact that some people have a very large carbon footprint in the same country, and some people have a very small one, just depending on how they live. Now, one of the things I don't like about this chart is it suggests that the best thing you can do is not have as many children. It's kind of ridiculous because why, if it's my carbon footprint, why am I responsible for what my child's carbon footprint is? Um, so I, I don't agree with this, uh, but you can see where this is going. And one of the interesting things about this is that, again, if you're from a country where, which is less wealthy and, and which does not use as much energy, then it doesn't really matter how many children you have. It's only in a very wealthy country uh, that produces a lot of carbon dioxide that the number of children you have uh, could be considered to be part of your carbon footprint. Altogether, these individual actions will never do enough to uh, reduce the greenhouse gases to the level that we need to do. And so we need to look at corporate actions, that is, actions that we take on as a society, as a country, 
as a world. And there have been people who have focused on this and, and tried to actually cost out what the benefits would be from these various investments and what they would cost us. And number one is actually what Dr. Caitlin Brady has worked on, and that's managing refrigerants. This is pretty in the woods, right? And again, notice probably I mean, nobody you know has been talking about this as a solution to climate change. But these hydrofluorocarbons that um, are, again, trace, trace gases, are powerful greenhouse gases. They're what are used in refrigerators and also in air conditioning units. And in this, just which ones, which formula we use can make an enormous difference in terms of uh, global warming. So I will let Dr. Grady talk about that in more detail. Wind turbines also is here. Wind turbines has a cost, it's an upfront cost, but there is a savings down the line. But notice that the rest really don't have costs. So these are lifestyle changes, not wasting as much food. Estimates are upwards of a third of food is wasted. People buy this big celery because they want one stalk and then the rest just rots in their refrigerator and they throw it away three weeks later. I'm sure you've been there, right? As have I. So this process of not wasting food, and any of you who've worked in food service know that an enormous amount of food gets scraped off the plates and thrown out um, at, the, at the end of the day from restaurants all over the world. So reducing food waste is a, a strange but important way to combat climate change. Changing to a, um, a meat-free diet or a diet with much lower meat um, and also protecting tropical forests. So again, in all of these, there really aren't costs up front. Um, the, the benefits in terms of carbon dioxide reduction are very serious. This whole argument that it would cost too much to respond to climate change really is not borne out by these facts. Solar farms, of course, uh, you all know what that is. Silvopasture is a process of um, looking at agriculture a bit differently, where you conserve the um, carbon that's in the soil through combining uh, trees, such as fruit trees, with uh, the uh, making the, the sowing of crops then on the ground. So Again, looking at, at all these different solutions, you can actually cost them out. Uh, Penn State was part of an international conference just about a year and a half ago on this and still very much involved with the drawdown process. And this then leads to international negotiations. So the fact that we must work as a world together, uh, that this must be part of the future, this is one of the reasons why we focus on climate negotiations, um, international climate negotiations in this last unit of the class. John Rawls, an important uh, philosopher, wrote way back 50 years ago, this theory of justice, where he argued that to understand justice, we need to develop a sense of ourselves in the world. And the way to do this is to be behind what he called a veil of ignorance. Not to know whether you'd be born male or female, wealthy or poor in this country or in that country. And, and making a choice then for the way you would want life to be not knowing what kinds of privileges or uh, what kinds of deficits you would have in your life. And so to think about this in terms of countries, I think is tremendously important because we don't even realize uh, how much energy we use in our lifestyle. We just turn on the lights. It's just the energy that's there. We, we don't think about the way that these things are put together in the United States. And so engaging in this negotiation is a way to put ourselves in the shoes of another country. Let me give you some examples. Country A, see if you can figure it out, has 16.1% of the world's gross domestic product. It used to have much more, now it has 16%. It spends half a trillion dollars, more than half a trillion dollars every year on the military, and it has emissions 
of 5,300 million metric tons carbon dioxide equivalent per year. Its population is 321 million. In comparison, country B has about the same size uh, GDP, used to be 4%, now it's much larger. It spends about a third as much on its military. It has twice the emissions, but its population is also more than four times as large. So these are vast disparities with these two countries. And then we add a third country with about the same size population, but a much lower percentage of world GDP. It spends less than a tenth of what country A does on its military. And its emissions are much, much lower, even though its population is about the size of country B. These three countries, I hope you figured out, are the US, China, and India. And together, they control about 40% of world GDP, about half its emissions, and have about 41% of the world's population. What these three countries do matters intensely in terms of climate negotiations. And consider the fact that there are also 105 other countries that each have less than 0.1% of world GDP. These disparities are really problematic because it's just what they call realpolitik. It's just the way the world is. You have to deal with the US, China, in India in terms of climate negotiations. It's all well and good to want to represent the Maldives, but the Maldives doesn't really have any voice. It doesn't pull the weight of these other countries. And so your job is to pick one of these countries and think very carefully, what do you want to represent um, at the climate, these climate negotiations? The only one that's excluded is the U.S. So no one may represent the U.S. at the negotiations. There are lots of reasons for that, but I really want you to think about what the position of other countries is at these negotiations. But there are two ways of thinking about negotiations. The standard one that I think a lot of people think about is what's called distributive negotiation. And this is basically the concept is that there is a pie. There are a certain amount of, of um, carbon that we can all spend. And so long as I spend more than you do, I win. And we can think about this looking at the rise of global emissions uh, and this huge spike, uh, China taking a larger and larger section of this pie. There are lots of problems with this kind of negotiation. Uh, one is, again, it's just focused on this issue of win and loss. And so therefore, the motivation is actually against reducing for, for all. If you don't need to be a part of these negotiations, for instance, when President Trump pulled the U.S. out of these negotiations, that's a position of strength. You guys do what you want. We're going to continue to spend as much carbon as we can. And, and so this in this kind of negotiation, to walk away is a position of extreme power, uh, to be able to control the negotiations by withdrawing from them. And so again, we've got a motivation to grab as much as you can and a motivation to leave. This production of us versus them has other consequences, right? And can lead to lots of international problems such as war. And we see this then with the COVID-19 response where international negotiations fell apart. Uh, we are focused of course a lot on the response here in the US, but note that many countries are only now starting to get uh, vaccines because this distribution was not negotiated in advance. An integrative negotiation is different. An integrative negotiation says that we're not just talking about one pie. We've got lots of different pies and lots of different issues on the table. 
And, and we, the more of these issues we put on the table, the more complex the negotiations are, but the greater chance that we'll get to a win-win situation. It is also much longer term, uh, not just focused on what's going to happen in this year or in the coming year, but really looking much farther down the line. Uh, what kind, again, this is this idea of the vision, right? What kind of planet are we leaving for future generations? What do we want the future to be? And because of all of this, there is then room for these smaller parties to play a role uh, and the, the process becomes messy and becomes, in some ways, it, it can be problematic, right? Because you've got more issues and more parties and it does have the, uh, the possibility of leading nowhere. You can think about it in terms of everyone giving up something, which is probably the case, but the, the focus on win-win on is a more positive way to, to think about this. And the idea here, again, by adding more and more things to the table, we really focus on what we all want ultimately a better life for ourselves, for our children, for the planet. Hardly anyone disagrees with that. And again, if you're thinking about this Rawlsian veil of ignorance, you don't presume that you are going to always be the beneficiary. You want to build a world of resilience and a multiplicity where there are more possibilities to the future than just one. So with this, we have to accept that there is a carbon budget. And this is gonna be your job uh, to negotiate. If we want to stay below 1.5 degrees centigrade, which is becoming increasingly unlikely, we could say that there are about 200 gigatons of carbon dioxide left to spend, left to burn. The current rate is about 40 per year. And that's just math. Five years, we've got five years. Obviously, if we reduce that rate of, of spending, that rate of burning, uh, then we get longer. So if we reduced our use, usage rate from 40 down to 20, then we get 10 years, but it's gonna have to be cutting our carbon footprint in half in two years, okay? Um, again, it's just math. Given that, we're just gonna give up on 1.5 degrees and accept that uh, as fact. Uh, the, the international negotiations have also pretty much said goodbye to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Let's try to stay below two degrees Celsius. And for this, our best guess is that we have 800 gigatons of carbon left. Again, that's 20 years at the current rate. You still have to figure out then how this budget is going to be distributed. Who gets what? What is the right role for each country? Do you make a quick reduction now? Do you assume there's gonna be the possibility of sequestering 10 gigatons per year in the future? How do you make those choices? And so in these mock negotiations, you're all going to prepare a short research paper so that you have some evidence to present what your country then can do, what it plans on doing, now what its resources are, what it would give up, what it needs to make a conversion to a clean energy economy. We're gonna really get into the woods a bit and try to work with one another to develop a response to climate change for at least these countries. So looking ahead this week, again, there's a wellness day on Wednesday, so no class. There's also no Zoom class on Friday. You'll be taking this virtual field trip instead. That will again include the opportunity for a five points extra credit if you submit a paragraph about that. We have class visits coming up from Rob Cooper and Dr. Caitlin Grady with webinars for each of them on the 14th and 21, just as it's listed in your syllabus. And we'll be preparing for this negotiation project. It's not too early to start thinking about which country you would like to represent. So that's it for now. Remember, climate solutions are as much about people as they are about technology. And ethics begins with 
our relationship with one another. So take it easy on yourself. Try to get out and enjoy this beautiful weather. Together we can make it through this semester. And if you're having any trouble at all, please don't hesitate to reach out to me.